And when they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, Ha! Huh, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from that cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes, were mocking him among themselves and saying, He saved others, he cannot save himself. And the people stood by, looking on. And even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise.
sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of those who were standing there, when they heard it, began saying, This man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran, and taking a sponge, he filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and gave him to drink. But the rest of them said, Let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished, in order that Scripture might be fulfilled, said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine upon a branch of hyssop and brought it up to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And behold, a man named Joseph, who was a member of the council, a good and righteous man. He had not consented to their plan and action, a man from Arimathea, a city of the Jews. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And he took it down, and he wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid him in a tomb cut into the rock where no one had ever lain. And it was the preparation day, and the Sabbath was about to begin. Some of the disciples were hiding. It was a turbulent time following the death of their master, Jesus Christ. Those who saw him as the Messiah were walking around in a daze, boggled over the death of one who was sent up, set up his eternal kingdom here on earth and released him from the bondage of Rome. But now they were all alone, with the enemy rejoicing over the death of the one whom the people called the Christ. The disciples were numb. Everything they believed in seemingly for the moment was worthless. The very person whom they made so many sacrifices for, the one who promised them they would rule on thrones, was dead. It was an eerie silence which wrapped the disciples as they sat stunned. They were unable to even talk about the unimaginable scene. The Messiah, hanging on a cross, dying before their very eyes. Questions raced through their minds. Helplessness crippled them. Fear paralyzed them as they imagined dying as their master did. Violent death. The scene opens with the disciples, James, John, Philip, and Bartholomew, sitting in the dark with elbows on their knees, staring down at the floor. The door to the room opens with Peter slipping in.
did you leave me? You know what really sticks out in my mind? Remember when we were all arguing over who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? We all had our opinion. In fact, it was my father who suggested we ask the master. I'll never forget the look on Jesus' face. As if we were in another time zone. I can still call us jockeying the position, thinking he was going to call our name first. It was as if we expected it. Then, you should have seen your faces. When Jesus called a child and placed it in the midst of us, right down in the middle, and said, unless you become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Your expectancy may call the greatest job to your facial expressions like a lead sinker. <laughs> and you should see Peter's face. Oh boy, John had a facial jolt. <laughs> Jesus is always demonstrating the way to heaven was simple. All anyone ever had to do was believe that he was the Messiah, the Lamb of God, who come to pay for the sins of the world. Even a child could do this, and they don't have the hang-ups we adults do. They just believe. Like I did. I bought into it. And now, I ask the question, where's Jesus? Why did he die? You know what impressed me most about Jesus? Was the way that he reacted to the prostitutes, to the soldiers, to the... Uh, Thieves, the pickpockets, the ones we didn't want anything to do with. I can't ever remember him just once condemning their actions. Remember the night we spent on the Mount of Olives with Jesus, and we came back to the temple area, and we had just arrived, and a noise behind us made us turn around and look. And here came those teachers of the law the, and the Pharisees, and they had this woman, this prostitute, and they were dragging her out into public. She was crying. She was embarrassed. She was trying to keep modesty. And they drug her right out in front of the group and made her stand there. And then they tried to discredit Jesus by saying that she needed to be stoned because she was caught in adultery and she had broken the law. And then... Jesus did something that blew me away. Something I didn't expect. I was standing right there by him. He didn't look at her. He didn't look at the Pharisees. He bent down and started to write in the sand. And I was ready to condemn that woman. She was guilty. She was caught in, in, in uh, adultery. I wouldn't have stoned her, but she still broke the law. And then he said something that blew me away. He said, Whoever among you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Do you remember that? Yeah. Well, that statement hit me like somebody had thrown a stone at me. Sin is sin. Whether you steal, or you commit adultery, or you lie, it's still sin. And then, just in a few minutes, the woman was standing there by herself. And Jesus stood up, and he looked at her, and he said, Where are the ones that condemned you? And she answered in a small voice, They are gone, sir. And he says, Neither do I condemn you. And with compassion and love in his voice, he says, Go and leave your life of sin. Jesus is the only man that I ever met that had compassion for the sinner. He always looked for the best in him. When we, the disciples, looked for the worst. Remember Matthew? A dreaded tax collector. And what did Jesus do? He went out and he got him and he brought him in and he made him one of us. And as I think about that, I know possibly now why I followed Jesus. 
He never once condemned me. But in compassion, he told me. He said, Bartholomew, come and follow me and sin no more. But where are you, Jesus? You know, Jesus was like no other man. Jesus claimed to be God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember the people he, that he healed? There was a leper, there was a blind, there was a cripple, there was the sick. He healed them all. And remember the man with the withered hand that was really withered up, and, and he came and he asked Jesus to heal him, and, and miraculously that hand restored back to normal? I mean, that was enough to prove that he was God. Oh, man, remember that the storm on the Sea of Galilee as we were attempting to get to the other side, and, and we're doing all we could to keep that boat afloat, and here came Jesus walking on the water, and I got so excited about that, I said, Lord, can I come out too? He said, yeah, come on out. I, I, I jumped on the boat without thinking, and I just landed on the water as if on dry land, and I was walking to him. Until this huge breaker crashed beside me and storm me something terrible. And I turned to see what was happening. I took my eyes off the maker and I started to sink, sink fast. And I knew if I yelled out, he wouldn't be able to hear me because of the storm. But in desperate, I yelled, Lord, save me! You know, it's just like Jesus. Always there for us. He just came on over and bent down and, and picked me up and carried me to the boat and placed me in it. You know, just like Jesus in, in the storms of our life, man, all we have to do is call out to Him. And he's always there for us and with compassion. Boy, Lord, I really miss you. I miss you terribly. I wish you didn't, wish you didn't have to go and, and die like that. Jesus, Jesus is more than just a friend to me. There's no doubt in my mind that he was the Messiah. His knowledge of the scriptures, his compassion, his love for mankind, which is thin down their weaknesses. I agree with you about Dalmia. I was ready to judge a prostitute too. And when Jesus began to speak, he got right to the point. The point wasn't that she was a prostitute. The point was, like you and me, we have sin. And that sin separates us from God. Kristen had to be called prostitution. For Matthew, it was fraud. Peter's yours was verbal harassment. Mine was judgment. But Jesus, Jesus made his point. The point being that you separate the man from the sin. Now if you took the heaven of sin away from a person, anyone could be a disciple. Jesus picked us. Not because I'm John, because you're Philip. But because Jesus saw a person who wanted to follow God. Jesus never once retaliated against the people. We charge him with the false crimes he was accused of. He's like a lamb being led to the slaughter. His love, his love for man never faded. Even when he was on the cross, suffering from tremendous pain, he never once condemned his people to put him up there. You remember that funeral procession we were at? When this little boy was dead? I was with Jesus. I was standing right beside him. Got tears in his eyes. He had such compassion for this woman who lost everything when her son died. He took the time to raise his boy from the dead. He went back to his mother. <coughs> Jesus loves us with a love that we can never comprehend. His love is so great that he never betrays us. This man I admire greatly, admire greatly is not dead. <laughs> Who knows what's going to happen next? Well, I don't know about you, fellas, but this has been a terrible day. 
and I just as soon forget it. And I'm going to try to get some sleep. I'm with Bartholomew. It's a day I like to put behind me. I hate the thought of going to sleep. All I need to do is relive those moments of my dream. Pounding with a hammer, screaming the Lord, why have thou forsaken me, Father? You don't catch me going to sleep. As soon as I go to sleep, I know the soldier's going to bust that door and haul me off to the crucifix. No, I'm not going to go to sleep. God, I don't understand what's happening. Do you think it's possible he could raise Jesus from the dead like he did in Lazarus? I'm sure you miss him. Oh well, tomorrow's another day.
you was asked what was the most significant event that ever happened in history, he paused for a second and he said, if Jesus raised from the dead, then that changes everything, doesn't it? Well, Larry, Jesus did raise from the dead. And it did change everything. You know, the, the Easter time is just not for today. It's for a whole life. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then you're missing out on a personal experience. Much like parachuting in our older age, isn't it? I've never been parachuting, but my brother did. And still can't believe he did it. And they came over the drop zone, and the first guy went to the big door. And he, and he said, okay, when we come through, you jump. And then one, two, three, and this guy just crawled on the door like this. Oh, and he didn't want to jump. And he pushed him from behind. No! Now, sometimes when it comes to Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, it gets scary. I mean, we have lived for so many years and, and been our own, but to give our life over to someone else, it looks like jumping out of that plane. And the guy did jump. And he screamed with delight. But they thought it was. All the way down. And when he finally hit the bottom, he couldn't wait to go up again. You know, we can be here, we can talk about Jesus dead in our life. But until you're ready to jump to the arms of Jesus, you never really know the thrill of it all. To have that peace that surpasses all understanding, to have the comfort in the life storms, those things you'll never experience until you're ready to make that jump. Larry King was right. Jesus did raise from the dead, and he changes everything. Historically proof that Jesus did raise from the dead. And he can change everything in your life. During this next song, or Easter song, we'll be closing out. If you feel like accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. If you're at the door, and it's one, two, three, and the Lord's saying, jump into my arms, you got to go and jump and experience something that change your life. If you'd like to accept Jesus, come right up here now. Let me share Jesus with you.
Lord, thank you for the excitement of Easter. In Jesus' name, amen. From our family to you, have a wonderful Easter.
this guy. I got the same problem. I got a 15 year old. Same
And we're just get up. We're, we're got right our right here. Right here. We're just 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 here. We're Okay, I want you guys just talk to the camera and... All at once or one at a time? One at a time. All at once. God has got the confusion, right? So it's one at a time. Why do you want to stand in here for? Good. Well, we're, I want you to remember this time. You're in front of the camera. See, it's flashing. It's going. What's that flash step for? It means that you are being taped. Very inquisitive. So, uh, <laughs> so John, you start us off. Oh, thanks, Sergeant James. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it was nice. I did. <laughs> that was deep. Let me, think, let me ponder that. Hi, Bob. Hi, <laughs> Mark. I enjoyed it. It was fun. I think I would have to agree with Bob Hoxson there. He said it was one of the best presentations he'd seen in years. Yeah. And very well put together, and I, I just thank God for that. And John? John. Should I take your lines down or should you put your <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank uh, Peter for his totally off the cuff, didn't follow a single word. <laughs> no, no, so he, no, no. <laughs> he never just said his part tw twice the same way. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine example. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. It was a great, great, great time. You guys pulled He's the squiggly. Perfect. He's the He's king, king of ad lib. <laughs> the king of ad lib. Okay. He's alive! He's alive! He's alive. Yeah. Go greet the camera and say oh, he's alive! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Cut! Take two! No fire. <laughs>